welcome to Money Matters TV. I'm going to be your host, Patty Tawadros, and my co-host today is Dave Emery from Marshall Financial Group, and we have an interesting guest today. Absolutely. Yeah. Nice so, to see uh, you. Yeah, nice to see you too. So. so tell me about how to plan for retirement. I'm an entrepreneur. You're an entrepreneur. Yeah. yeah. We, we actually, that, that's one of the big areas that we're seeing more and more clients come in, and it's really trying to understand how all the pieces of retirement fit together. And uh, um, recently had a, had a client come in and they have a retirement accounts, Social Security, um, want to move from, from Pennsylvania down to the villages. I don't know if you've seen those the two villages, villages, the in, villages in Florida. I mean, this is this, this facility, over 55 community where they, <coughs> You can play golf all the time. All oh, these one of my friends picked like out that. the condo that she's going to buy, and yeah. she told me I could get the one next door. That's great. And we're not anywhere near retirement, but yeah, yeah she's picked it out for us. <laughs> so I mean, there, there's many pieces, and just understanding the transition going mm -hmm. from from the work life environment to the next stage in life uh, is you know, it's, there's it, it really once you make that, that change it's difficult if you if you didn't plan correctly to go back and get the income you know go and get a job similar job to what you had a lot of times so we help them uh, figure out all that all that out and help them plan their transition what is the average retirement age it's, now i'll tell you it's i guess it all depends i mean you know i guess that can be answered a number of different ways yeah, when do a lot of people retire? I mean, some people wait until they're age 65 so they can qualify for, for Medicare. Uh, full retirement age for Social Security is between 66 and 67 to get your full benefit. Um, pensions, if, if people still have pensions, you know, they, they range all over the place as to how you can start taking it. So, My brother has a pension. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't know that till a couple of years ago, and I feel really jealous. I know, <laughs> yeah. I know, I feel jealous too. I mean, pensions are definitely one of those those areas that um, they're, they're, they're kind of going a thing of the past. So, so in the old days, it used to be that uh, I th think you've said the term before, mm -hmm. cliff retirement, that you hit your retirement and then you stayed home right. and watched TV. But now people seem to be working. Is that yeah, true? Yeah, a lot of times people do work uh, part time in retirement to help supplement it. And, and really what it would we're finding is really important is to have a plan on 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 what you're going toward in retirement what i mean by that is you know, what is retirement going to look like you know especially men we've seen that men oftentimes once they retire they they, they think they have a lot of things they want to do but they get bored um, so that coupled with the whole fact of uh, maintaining your social network i know, mm -hmm. you know we're going to talk a little bit about relationships later in the show um, but Men in particular, from what I, I've seen, is you know, it, it, a lot of times their, their network and their relationships are centered around their, their, their job. And once they leave their job, then if they, they don't make a conscious effort, um, you know, that can be a difficult transition. Whereas women, they, they just seem to do a much better job on the whole relationship side of things. I've actually heard uh, men and women, maybe it's focused on men, but when you retire, if you don't mm -hmm. have something to do, right. whatever it is, you actually don't live that long. That's right. Is yeah. that I mean, statistically it's, it's true? It kind of goes back to having a purpose mm -hmm. and uh, um, going toward that is, and, and you know, into retirement, I mean, there's different phases of retirement too. Oftentimes they, for people refer to the beginning retirement called the go-go years where you go and do a lot of the things that you wanted to do. The, the, work got in the way of you know, vacationing and hobbies and things like that. Um, so we help plan for, you know, f from a financial perspective on, on that. And then the next phase is kind of the, the slow go years where you kind of slow down a little bit. And then the last phase they call the no go years where you, you know, you're aging. And there's different expenses associated with each one of them. You know, understanding the income streams and, and the lifestyle as you go through it is, is important to give you a quality of life and, a, and you know, a state of mind that, that um, you know, that you can happily retire. Do you help so. people with estate planning? So Yeah, we, we get into that too. So, both And when is it too late for that? My mom is in her 80s and, you know, we don't have an estate plan. Yeah. No, that, I think it makes a lot of sense to have at least some of the legal documents set up mm -hmm. uh, with regards to estate planning. Because um, it's wills. real estate a lot, right? I mean, well, she has a will, but as far as... Uh, there's also you have a home. Uh, yeah, the, um, the three big documents we talked through, we're not lawyers, mm -hmm. but 
we help clients with making the decisions it has to do with with a will, um, uh, power of attorney for your financial affairs, and health care power of attorney. So a lot of you know, those are the three big document, three main documents that uh, you know, ought to be up to date. And you know, life changes. I mean, you know, through different events. I mean, I have one client who who hasn't had their estate documents done since the early 90s, back when they the kids were growing up, and now they're retired. And, um, you know, the, you know, things estate documents ought to be refreshed from time to time because even Pennsylvania state law changes. It just recently changed pertaining to um, power of attorney within the last couple of years. So. Well, I know you do a lot of divorce stuff too, right. so you got to remind your clients to change That's their will, exactly right? Exactly right. Once you, I had another client that uh, got divorced or was in the process of getting divorced, and actually was divorced and ex-husband passed away and didn't change any of his estate documents and she ended up getting all of his wealth. Oh, <laughs> but she was real broken right. up over that yeah. one, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So tell me a little bit about your business and how you're, you know, using social social media. So we have a full service consulting design firm. Mm -hmm. But an important thing is social media. And you have companies that say, "Oh, I don't want to get involved in that." Like, "Oh, I'm not interested. Right. I don't have time." And the thing that I always have to remind mm -hmm. them is just because you don't want to talk about your company right. doesn't mean no one else is talking about right. you. So you need to get involved so that you can respond and mm -hmm. you can make the direction of your brand so that what people are saying about you and talking about is something that you're aware of and that you can address. Right. Yeah. That's got to be huge. I mean, you know, we're becoming such a digital society these days that uh, having an understanding of what's said about you can, is, is huge, what, both good and bad. I mean, yeah. wh what happens when you get the bad, I mean, the bad side of things? Is there areas to help correct that? that help There's a, yeah, so let's say someone goes on your Facebook page mm -hmm. and tells you that I bought your widget and it broke, it caught right. fire, whatever it is. Right. Uh, you need to take the conversation offline so that the thread on Facebook or Twitter mm -hmm. doesn't become a, uh, you know, a long paragraph right. of somebody bashing you. So you want to take them offline, resolve the problem, then go back online. And I mean in a public environment and say, we're so happy we're able to help you resolve your issue. So that if someone comes across that thread, they don't see it just abruptly end. They right. see that there's a resolution and the company cares. Makes sense. Yeah. And you might see really funny threads on social mm -hmm. media where I saw it was a a grocery store in England hmm. and somebody got I don't know, bread and there was something wrong with the bread and they posted it and they said to the supermarket I'm really disappointed about this bread hmm. there's a hole in my bread I can't believe you and they had a really cheeky sense of humor and they got on there and they hmm. engaged in a really fun way and then they sent their delivery person to his house with a bag of bread oh, you neat. know we want you to have sandwiches and yeah. it became a really positive experience so I, yeah. I think that you can really use it to shift right conversations. And it reaches so many people so that's uh, you know in, in, in an age gone by I mean it was just like the newspaper now it's you know with social media there's so many people can see it's out there and it's, I guess it's, it's out there forever right here it's forever yeah. and it's instant Right, in an instant. And people do use it to react, which mm -hmm. is very bad. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a, a grip on yourself. Right. And you look at some of the things that are happening in this election season, what people are saying, you know, friend to friend. Right. You can offend people very easily and lose friends, yeah. which, you know, might not be bad to figure out who those people are and right. get rid of them from your social feed. But at the same time, some of the candidates have said some very inflammatory things used in yeah. social media and it's instant and you can't take it back. Mm -hmm. And even if you delete it, somebody's taking a screenshot and they'll show it to someone else. So my yeah. advice is to hold your tongue. Right. Think about it twice, write it once. Yeah. Yeah. I gotta think there's more negative social media than, than positive, is that right or am I wrong? Uh, about no. I wouldn't yeah. say that. Yeah. Okay. It well, depends what you mean by negative. Yeah. Well, do people go out and complain more than they would uh, giving accolades? I will say that the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Right. So if people complain, they will get a resolution. Right. If the company that they're complaining to is paying attention. Yeah. But, you know, if they're not, yeah. then you're right. Yeah. So yeah. how about I ask you this question? Sure. Okay. So our question is from... Samuel Wilson and Marion, and the question is, on the internet, what is a good source for college scholarships? College scholarships. 
Yeah, that's one of the areas I help clients with. I help them understand how to reduce the cost of educating their their um, their children, their kids, and scholarships comes up regularly. And I, I initially start out by saying, look locally. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, a lot of times applying for scholarships, it's a lot of work, and unfortunately, not a lot of um, uh, payback, especially when it comes to national scholarships. Uh, but a lot of times locally, um, you know. Your own employer sometimes will have their own scholarships, uh, nonprofits, um, sometimes hospitals do, you know, rotary clubs, lions clubs, things like that. Even, even some, um, there, there's scholarships, uh, um, I live up in Bucks County and there is a scholarship that um, somebody had created that who's, who, who just thought education was a good thing as long as you demonstrate need. So I think locally is the best place to look for, for scholarships. Sometimes those scholarships, see, I've seen it where they, they go unfilled from the standpoint there's not enough applicants to, to hand out the money to. Other areas are with regards to understanding the schools you're, you're applying to. Um, <clears throat> and basically what, where this is headed is you know, helping to access the endowment funds where both need-based scholarships are funded from and also merit-based scholarships are, fun are funded from. And, um, you know, understanding what a co from a standpoint of merit, merit aid is is aid that is based on something schools want. It's not based on family finances, and understanding what a college may be looking for. Um, a lot of times, it comes in the form of academic um, or talent, such as athletic or musical, even diversity. There's a big thing with regards to having a very diverse student body, and colleges will give money to uh, accommodate that need. So, um, Do you remember a guy on Shark Tank that pitched Yeah, I, a there platform? was something. There isn't, was an app. Isn't that and guy I, I don't local? That. I, isn't he from Philly? He may have been. I remember seeing that. I don't remember his app, though. Neither do I, but maybe yeah. people could Google That's that. Right. That's right. And find right. the app for scholarships. Right. But yeah, he got funding for that. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't I haven't seen that though. I mean, it's uh, um, but you know, it's co colleges are, are you know that's a huge source to help okay. reduce college costs. All right. so great. That helps. Okay, well we're sure that you have questions too that you'd like to answer, and you can do that by sending them in. You can have your questions answered on Money Matters. Please go to our website money-matters-tv.com on our homepage, click on the banner on the right that says, send us your questions. While you're on our website, you can find information about our hosts and guests, as well as show notes and links about this show and past shows. Money Matters is also available as a podcast on iTunes and Stitcher, so you can listen to Money Matters while you're on the go. That website address, again, is money, M-O-N-E-Y, dash matters, M-A-T-T-E-R-S, tv.com Welcome back. I am excited to tell you that we're going to meet this author, Ed Wallace, who wrote this book, which you're going to be able to buy online or in bookstores. And before we meet him, we're going to watch a clip. <laughs> As a new leader, you have an awful lot on your plate. But the single best piece of advice I can provide new leaders is to think about relationships with intentionality. And the best way to do that is really simple. There's a universal framework that spans whatever generation you're working with, and I call that relational GPS. Relational GPS is, is just like the GPS systems in our car, the roadmaps to our travel success. Relational GPS is the roadmap to relational success. Hmm. Because everybody you work with, they're going to have business and personal goals. They're going to have causes or passions, things they care deeply about. Oh. And what human being do we know that doesn't have any struggles? And the sooner we can tap into that information, the better chance we have to advance the relationship, to create credibility and trust, and to just be ourselves. Relational leaders focus on every interaction, and they do that by focusing on the relationship first. It's really nice to meet you, Ed. Great to meet you, Patty. The name of your company is Relational Management Group? Relational Capital Group. Capital Group. Yes. Capital Group. So what is that? 
Tell us about your business. Relational Capital Group is a company I founded 10 years ago uh, on the premise that no one ever told me that relationships aren't important to their business. Yet whenever I asked them what they did about that, well, we just hire great people. And that's kind of risky because now you're more or less saying, well, we're just going to trust that these really great people are going to sell our product, treat our customers correctly, uh, et cetera. And uh, there was really no organizations out there teaching a process for relationships. So that's what we've been doing for the last 10 years, working with large companies like Dow Chemical, Iron Mountain, SAP. Uh, we've been on four different continents. It's, it's been really, really a lot of fun. That's fantastic. That's great. So, so what Thank are you. people doing wrong regarding that, regarding relationship management? Yeah, and that question, wrong, it, it always, you know, what yeah. are we doing wrong? I, I think if we could use the W word, the wrong word, right. uh, we're taking them for granted. Mm -hmm. We tend to think they're stronger than they are. Uh, some research indicated that our best relationships are only working about 45% mm. of their potential. Now think about your best relationships, right. Dave. Right. You have an amazing practice, mm -hmm. a lot of clients you serve very well in financial services. Think of the best person. Right. Patty, think of your best customer. If it's only working at 45% of its potential, if you fall within the averages, mm -hmm. what more could you be doing there? Right. That's a question for you. What yes. more could you be doing there? Uh, probably reaching out more to them, staying you know, in, in touch with them, providing some, you know, something that I don't know that they need. We tend to look at our best customers and, and, and well, they're going to renew or they're going to mm -hmm. re-up with us or they're going to re-sign our, whatever it is we do. Right. And then all, but what we tend to forget is other people are calling on them as well. Right. And we usually work with large corporations. Uh, the, the good news is there aren't a lot of companies that teach business relationships. So right. we're kind of lucky. I, I picked the one thing I was good at in life. That's great. And that was building relationships. Mm -hmm. The challenge was writing it down for mm -hmm. people. So when I, when, I, when I was in sales years ago, uh, you know, they'd send young salespeople out with mm -hmm. me and, and I'm like, well, just do what I do. And they'd walk away like, what exactly did you do? They all seem to like you. What is right. it you did? And until I actually had to write it down or think about it in terms of a process, uh, that's when the light bulbs start, start going off and uh, that led to the latest book. So what is the, what is a couple of things that key to your success with regards to relationships? The key to my success yeah. or the key to success? Well, I guess the, the key, both. Okay. <laughs> I mean, uh, you so you, you love to get me talking yeah, about myself. Right. I'd rather yeah. talk about everybody else. Um, let's talk about the key to business relationships right. in general. A uh, survey was done about four or five years ago. They asked senior executives across Fortune 500 companies, all functional areas, not just HR or the right. CEO or sales. So think about your hard sk mm -hmm. skilled areas like finance, R&D, mm -hmm. IT. They asked these executives, what's the secret to your success year in and year out? 89% mm -hmm. came back and said relationships. Hmm. If you think about your own websites, if right. you think about any corporate website, they generally have client customer relationships on the front page. If they don't, they better talk to their marketing. They better hire Patty, right? right. They better hire Patty to, f to clean up that home page. The same survey went on to ask these executives, what do you do about that? Mm -hmm. Only 24% respond that we can do anything about, we do anything intentionally about relationships. And when they ask those 24%, what is it you do? We have a CRM system to manage our relationships. Hmm. A customer relationship right. management system or a contact, you know, they contact call it CRM. Yeah. And I ask you, is there really an R in CRM, Dave? <laughs> is there an R in there? Right. We, we put it in there. Right. Human beings, belly right. buttons put that R into CRM. Right. Uh, so really smart people mm -hmm. who believe relationships are the key to their success paradoxically rely on technology for what's more or less a human calculation. Right. Survey concluded with uh, less than 5% of people really think about relationships with intentionality. Mm -hmm. That's a word I use in the relationship engine. Mm -hmm. Intentionality starts with thinking about, you know, Patty, you've got a bunch of LinkedIn connections, right? Mm -hmm. You've got business goals for your, for your business. Thinking about if you only had five people, and this goes to Dave's point as well as like staying in touch with them, or if you had only had five people to help you accomplish your objectives for the year, who are those five people? Not, you know, ABC company, not this client account, but the human being there. And that human being is very distinctive in the way you relate with them. Uh, we, we talk about a concept called relational GPS. And if the viewers and you guys leave with one thing, uh, almost every audience we work with takes this concept. 
Uh, everybody you work with should have something along the lines of business and personal goals, that's the G, mm -hmm. causes or passions, things they care deeply about, right. and, or the, and or struggles. And I, have you run into anybody that doesn't have struggles in life, Dave? <laughs> no, I haven't. Everybody's got struggles. That's right. We call relational GPS the roadmap to relational success because if, if you can just capture those three mm -hmm. things about the people you're working with right. or you're prospecting with or you're referring, whoever it is you're working with, there's a very good chance that you're going to be at advanced relationship mm -hmm. faster. The faster you advance the relationship, the better chance you have to work on common goals and get some stuff done. Right. So I call, I'm sorry. sorry. I've read some stuff recently that they talk about um, how you grow as a salesperson in a business, mm -hmm. and they said that they saw more success with people that challenge the challenger personality. Mm -hmm. So I felt like there was more of a hybrid because you need to have a good relationship with your contact in order to come in and give them some tough love about their business. It's really interesting. We, we work with clients who use the challenger sales methodology. Right. Our approach is not a sales methodology, it's a leadership methodology. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, there's a subtlety there. Right. The challenger sale, uh, spin selling, all the different leading, uh, our, our process, our approach is, is sales process agnostic mm -hmm. because within that process, you've got to build relationships. Right. And it's really interesting, one of our clients, Dow Chemical, uses the challenger sale. And the challenger sale guy introduces me and our process after he gets finished because he said, you know, we talk in here in our research that relationship selling is not really the way to go. And, and, and you're going to meet this firm now, Relational Capital Group. They don't do relationship selling. They help you think about relationships as a process, as a competency. Mm. And I think that's the thing that's missing. I think we, we looked at, we in general look at people like they either have it or they don't when it comes to relationship. Mm. And, and what the, the code we've kind of cracked is, no, it's a skill. Right. It's a competency that can be learned and practiced if you think about principles, if you think about a process. Uh, we have processes for everything in life. Why not a process for relationships? Right. Makes sense. Yeah. Um, so tell, talk a little bit about networking, the difference mm -hmm. between you know, um, relationships and the, and the whole concept of networking. What's, what's right with that? Networking is really important. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to marginalize all the experts who talk about networking. Um, the, the challenge with networking is we accumulate a lot of these ethereal relationships. And those are the ones in LinkedIn, those are the ones right. that, however we accumulate, and, and it's kind of a badge for us. Right. I've got X hundred or thousand LinkedIn connections. Uh, and I was giving a speech, and I forget where it was, and this topic came up and the person stood up and asked the question, they had the microphone mm -hmm. and everything, and I said, well, I have, I have 1,500 LinkedIn connections. And as they're sitting down, I said, so how's that working for you? Mm -hmm. And he got back up and he says, not really, not very well. Right. And uh, I, I think we tend to look at the uh, achievement of the numeric match versus maybe there's five or 10 people in there that if we really reached out to, figured out a way to launch the relationship, figured out a way to find common ground, learn about their GPS, right. and then went into the whole thing with good intentions, there's probably a better chance we're gonna accomplish things than worrying about the mass number that we have. I think technology, I mean, it's, it's um, things have changed with the advent of all this technology. And I think you know, relationships and in, in maybe a, 20 years ago were easier in some aspect to maintain just because the technology wasn't mm -hmm. there. Is it, what do you think about that? Well, I think we worked harder before we had technology right. at our relationships. Exactly. I, I think we, we had to work harder. Uh, in your introduction, you were talking about the word proximity came to mind. Right. And I, I for, you know, as you were talking about when people retire and uh, men in general, mm -hmm. uh, we become less proximate with the people we're connected right. with. Uh, I think social media allows us to be less proximate, allows us to be braver, say things maybe we shouldn't say. I love when Patty yeah. said, you know, hey, once you say it, you can't take it back. Once right. you type it and hit send, you can't take that back. I mean, how many athletes are learning that exactly. today, right? Yeah. I mean, and you mentioned politicians. Uh, I, I think. Uh, in the relationship engine, we talk about making every interaction matter. So if you are communicating mm -hmm. through social media, how do we make that special? Right. How do we create an experience? A relational leader creates what we call a competitor-proof experience for the people they're working with. 
Hmm. Uh, if you think about that term, competitor proof, right. it's a pretty all in. How do I competitor proof myself? Well, in business today, just about everything can be commoditized, digitized, right. or outsourced. I'm sure people can look at your business and say, oh, well, they do financial advising, but there's something about the experience you create, Dave, right. that keeps them coming back That's and gets right. you those referrals. Right. Patty, same thing with you. There's something about, and who knows what it is. It could be the handwritten note you send to someone after you have a great meeting with them, which, mm -hmm. by the way, needs to come back. Mm -hmm. um, I agree. Uh, I agree. Yeah, absolutely. I have a stationary that, that, I'm company. taking us down a different yeah. path here, but <laughs> right. but 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 we re we receive less we receive less than one percent of our business mail handwritten today. Hmm. Think about how powerful that is. Yeah. Even if you have a client interaction, they're not going to become your client. Yeah. Sending that handwritten note sends right. such a strong message about, hey, I really value the time you invested with us, mm -hmm. uh, with me that day. Uh, hey, you know what? Let's stay in contact. You never know. That person might say something to someone else, and we can never measure that right. until we add everything up at the end of the year. It's like, that was a pretty good year, and relationships kind of grew this year. I always say that there's too much noise. People don't mm -hmm. read their email anymore. I know that I yeah. select, and if I don't know people, I just delete the whole lot of it because right. I don't have time. You get right. too many phone calls, too many emails. Or you click, open it, glance, and, and delete it. Yeah. And maybe there, and there might have been some kind of message in there, but most of the time, so, so it's becoming a, like a herd mentality where everything is coming at us. Uh, I, I like to say we spend 60% of our time in meetings. That's the statistic that, that mm -hmm. I've learned about. 30% on mail and 10% getting things done. Hmm. I agree with that. Kind of sounds like everybody's yeah. day. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's why I think personal written notes and phone calls are mm -hmm. definitely making a comeback. So we only have a couple minutes left. Do you want to sure. give us a, a, re a number one reason why somebody should buy your book? Number one reason why someone should buy this because book is Because of something they're going to learn. Uh, we, we talk about the relationship engine connecting with the people who power your business. Mm -hmm. And uh, I believe that if we think about the relationship engine is based on five principles and the first principle is worthy intent. And uh, worthy intent is, as it sounds, putting other people ahead of us. Mm -hmm. I don't believe we don't do that. I believe right. we do that. I believe when we're working with people, we do have good intentions. Mm -hmm. The challenge with worthy intent and principle number one in the book is, what kind of response are we getting? Right. Are, are they giving us extra meeting time? Are they sharing confidence with us? Are they introducing us to people? Mm -hmm. So worthy intent is not about having good intentions. Mm -hmm. And, and, and in, in the book, worthy intent is the relationship engine. Right. It drives everything. If you think about every leadership methodology, it starts with good intentions towards right. others. So we spend a lot of time on worthy intent. And uh, worthy intent leads to something we were talking about when we were prepping earlier, thoughtfulness. Mm -hmm. That's uh, I hate to cut you off, yeah. but we are out of time. Okay, great. So people can get this in the bookstore. You have a couple books, I know, right? Thank you, yes. Yeah, so it was really, I think we could stay here all day and we talk could. about this stuff, Absolutely. right? Absolutely, great time. Yeah. Thanks, Patty. Right. Thanks, yeah. Dave. Great Thank being you. with you both. Thanks. So I hope you'll join us again next week. Our guest is going to be Brendan Gilmore from Mercap Securities, LLC. Thank you so much for joining us. This is Money Matters TV.